Bex thing. I forgot I had to click the green button. Yeah, I just noticed it as well. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Thank you for joining our webinar today. We're really excited to talk to you guys about the role of customer experience and the role of um, data analytics user experience and advertising operations in the digital transformation initiative. Um, we're joined by some storied and experienced um, speakers today that each represent uh, years of experience working within their disciplines, and we're really excited and privileged to have them here today. Um, and so, yeah, we're just going to give a few minutes just to have some people trickle in. Um, I know we just started a little late because I forgot to turn it on live. So we're going to give people just another minute or two um, to come on if you guys don't mind. Yeah, not a problem, honestly. Sounds good. I'll be the first one to turn my camera on. <laughs> the bravest. Hello, Matt. It's good to see you. Let me Same let me time. turn let me turn my webcam on. How's it going, everybody? Awesome. You guys see this like very artful wall behind me? I made sure to position myself there. It looks very nice. Sophisticated. <laughs> All right, there you go, Sean. What's going on? Hey, what's up, Sean? How's it going, man? Good. All right. Is your microphone on there, Sean? Yeah, Sean, I can't hear you. The old oh, guy sorry, I didn't have it on. Um, nice. There we go. There you go. I hear you, brother. Like Loud and clear. <laughs> Sean, that's a cool staircase behind you. You live yeah, like it's, uh, yeah, yeah. That's where the uh, the work layer is. Except the lighting up there is just uh, would be really bad for the webcam. So I usually come down into the the living room. Uh, maybe I'll position the, you can see the vacuum a little bit right over there. I'm not <laughs> sure to position it perfectly. There we go. Nice. Nice. Mm. Yeah, let me just uh, let me just make sure I got my recording on. Mike, it's great to see you. Good to see you. Awesome. Let's see. Let's see. All right. Out of full screen, so I can get this recorded. All right, guys, thanks so much for joining. Awesome. Let's have a great, great session. Awesome. Okay, I am recording. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, super excited. This is Gander Flock's first ever live webinar and we're joined by three um, amazing subject matter experts. We're joined by Matt Stoner here on my right, um, Professor Mike McGurk here on the bottom and Sean McLaughlin there on the bottom right. And so we're gonna be taking you through a very simple kind of high level presentation and we're gonna be alerting you to really some of the things that you need to know about digital transformation and some things that you really just cannot ignore when you're going through these digital transformation initiatives in the enterprise and in your business. Um, so I guess just to kick off, I'll, I'll kind of do a little screen share here of, let me, let me get my slide up. I got this slide here, but uh, I really want to just give a presentation briefly on the importance of integration in 
customer experience. Um, it's super important. A lot of people, you know, sometimes make the mistake of trying to do things piecemeal when they are initiating their digital transformation initiatives. And there's really no surprise to executioners like us to see that a lot of those initiatives tend to fail. And the reason they fail is simply because um, of a lack of integration, right? Everyone's in silos and it's really tough to, it's really tough to be able to actually um, deliver those breakthrough results that you want to deliver if you don't talk between different departments, right? So marketing, customer support, the data, the, you know, the data science team, the advertising team, user experience, product, all these are very crucial um, in terms of actually initiating successful digital transformation. And that's why, according to the IDC, which is definitely a thought leader in this space, they reckon about 70% of digital transformation initiatives in 2018 will fail due to a lack of collaboration and silos. So this is a big issue. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why um, a lot of enterprises aren't able to mobilize effectively and um, actually deliver what they need to deliver. Um, and the reason being is really because their data is really not accessible. They don't have access to any of their data. And this is a big issue. So I'm going to take you through this presentation quickly. But this is meant to kick off um, the panel and our subject matter experts really get some information to you. So the really big, big highlight here is uh, this stat right here. And it says like nearly three quarters of business leaders said that delivering a relevant and reliable customer experience is critical to their company's overall business performance today. And almost all of them agreed that it would be incredibly relevant to them in two years, right? So we have a general consensus that the digital customer experiences need to be improved and they need to be improved through a variety of methods such as integration. And we'll kind of get into that in a little bit. So these are some general stats. I got these from Harvard Business Review. They have a fantastic article on the state of customer experience in the United States. And a lot of American companies simply are not prepared to make this jump. Um, you know, in addition to 73% of the leaders saying it's important, only 13% of those companies actually have the infrastructure needed to deliver effective digital transformation. And, you know, you're talking about more than three quarters of data that's exposed um, that a business has is actually even available to, to um, be actually analyzed. And so the reason that we're talking so much about customer experience is not just a buzzword. This is something that's incredibly important to delivering true business results. Um, so we're really looking at our long two factors of importance and effectiveness. And really, you know, through this study, um, through Harvard Business Review in April 2017, we find that many people in the enterprise are really focused on uh, developing a customer-centric culture, right? But how effective is that in terms of delivering ROI is still, you know, we're still, we still have yet to see that. But, you know, uh, it all starts with culture. And no initiative can, can go well if your culture is incredibly siloed and you do not um, try to initiate or integrate uh, departments into these special teams. You know, we find oftentimes um, the best way for digital transformation to take effect in an organization is to actually develop these integrated teams and bringing people together that normally wouldn't speak. Um, you know, again, and the second point that's uh, super important is management and leadership buy-in. You know, you really do have to get everyone on the team together in order to facilitate an effective digital transformation. You really cannot do this within one department, you know, if you're focusing just on the IT department and they're focusing on, you know, their incremental benefits, yes, they may be able to develop an application that, you know, is able to optimize something by 20%. But if you look at over, overall organizational effectiveness, it's pretty low. And that's simply because you're not taking into account all the other different aspects of the business. Um, and so, you know, another thing that uh, a lot of business leaders think is, is incredibly important is seeing visibility into and understanding, you know, the end customer experience. So throughout the digital transformation process, you know, we always talk about reimagining a lot of your customer journeys using these digital tools, using data, using segmentation to understand more about your end users so you can deliver to them. Some uh, business leaders are able to set um, their customer experience strategies and, and have support from the CEO and people in the C-suite so that line of business users can, you know, feel empowered about, you know, taking on some of these challenges. Um, 
And so really what ultimately what customer experience, what, you know, digital transformation and, you know, revitalized customer experiences are able to provide to you is able to provide clarity around the customer experience, um, their value and the return on investment for all of your marketing initiatives that you're having. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of different reasons and I really don't want to get too bogged down in them. But um, those are some of the top five um, reasons that a lot of business owners really find um, it important to uh, focus on customer experience. And so next, you know, really uh, what we're seeing in the field is that a lot of customer experience leaders, they really want to prioritize culture. They want to prioritize the value of strategy. They really understand the importance of having the right skills and having the right people. And they also understand that none of this happens without having access to data, right? And so when over three quarters of, you know, an organization's data isn't readily available to be analyzed, right? You need to transform that, extract it, transform it, load it, all these different things. You know, that is a significant barrier um, to businesses really delivering fantastic customer experience. And this is really the key to unlocking things like customer attention, growth, and hitting a lot of your business goals and KPIs. Um, and so it does much more than just helping you sell to customers. You know, it really helps build a better team. It helps build better internal processes. And it also empowers employees. You know, digital transformation empowers employees because now employees are able to see and gain insight and visibility into the business. They can see how they're performing and they're better able to gauge um, customers' wants and needs. And so this is something that is um, that we will repeatedly harp on throughout the course of our presentation. It's just the ability to listen and really dial in. And so uh, Mike, our data analytics subject matter expert, is going to be getting into that. Uh, and uh, yeah, so for the fourth figure, we're really looking at, you know, a company's willingness, right? A company's willingness to really initiate a lot of these digital transformation initiatives. And is are they, are they able to actually initiate these things, right? And so how responsive are they? Are they? And so you see in this right here that, you know, that leaders are typically expected to be the ones that are kind of championing, championing a lot of these processes. But, you know, you can see that, um, you know, leaders and people who take the initiative and who, who really take the initiative on to initiate digital transformation in their organizations and just start the process, you're really finding that they're really at the top of um, customer experience, you know, when you, when you gauge them against their competitors that, you know, might not um, see the importance of investing into it now. And clearly you can see what laggards, uh, you can see the clear delineation between the two groups there. And finally, I just kind of want to show you guys a little bit about, um, you know, companies that do not act on data, right? So how much of the customer data that your organization collects are you able to act upon? You're, you're seeing, you know, success rates that are pretty low. Um, you know, when you're looking in terms of laggards, they really have a higher percentage in terms of not being able to actually access their data. And you find this really clear line between the two, between uh, leaders and laggards. And so this gap will continue to widen. Um, and there's some relevant material from McKinsey Research on that, um, talking about, you know, just the effect that um, underinvestment in digital transformation can have in your capability to actually uh, fight disruption. You know, even though most business leaders view disruption as a positive uh, way to initiate some form of change, um, they do also recognize that that really doesn't happen unless you have access to data. So we're really seeing the gap widen between the have and the have nots in terms of organizations that are embracing, you know, data visibility, right? Embracing single sources of truth embracing, um, you know, line of business users, being able to run analytics and, you know, be able to monitor and track their performance in real time. This is, all these things are super important. That's really the difference. That's going to make the biggest difference within the next five years and the next decade in terms of you retaining and growing your market share. You know, this is something that's important as you have more nimble and agile competitors coming your way you're definitely going to have more issues related to keeping up with them and, and, you know, ensuring that your business model and your operating model is still viable in 2018. Um, so really the crux of this, and I'm pretty sure Mike can speak to it a little bit, um, is really a business runs off their data. Modern businesses are only as valuable as the data that they're able to collect. And, you know, a lot of these businesses have their data split up 
and siloed between different departments. We're really looking at, you know, um, you know, data split between the finance department, data split between the marketing department, sales department, and different types of things. And so what this does is it really creates a fragmented customer experience and, and it overall makes your sales process much, much harder. Sales enablement becomes more difficult. Um, you know, conversion becomes more difficult. You're gonna probably be spending more money to acquire customers than you would, right? And also delivering those personalized experiences. That's gonna be really tough if you do not have what's known as a single source of truth. And this just really means getting all that data from your point of sale, from your website, from your applications, and putting them all into one platform where you can access it. And so there are a few tips and uh, tricks that we can definitely talk about in another webinar and some tools that we use to kind of allow that to happen. Um, and so a uh, reason why it's tough to share data, you know, and if you're talking about process, and infrastructure, you know, the lack of the systems, the standardization, the data strategy, right? And data quality issues all lead to really negative consequences when it comes to processing and, um, you know, actually transforming and um, analyzing data. Um, and so the inconsistent collection of data is also something that is a big impediment to um, organizational success. Um, you know, about 80% of a data scientist's time is spent cleaning their data sets, not really um, spending time in insight mode and delivering insight and delivering value back to the business. So with that, um, I hope I was able to imbue upon you a little bit of what, a little bit why it's important to have integration when you're thinking about digital transformation and to think of your customer experience as an integrated um, experience. And so with that, I would definitely want to pass it off to uh, Matt Stoner here, and uh, he can take us through his presentation on the importance of user experience in digital transformation. Matt, go ahead. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Hansen, for putting this together, and Sean and Mike for being here. Um, I'm a partner at the Palo Alto Consultancy Neuron. Are you guys hearing a playback issue? I am a little bit. Give me a second. How about now? Okay, you sound good now. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm a partner of the Palo Alto-based user experience consultancy, Neuron. Um, we are a full-service consultancy. We specialize in um, digital strategy, UX, and full-stack development. Um, what we like to do is take on projects as big as creating a full MVP um, specification for uh, nothing more than a concept or improving upon an existing product that a company might be looking to invest um, or design resources in. So I think um, what I really want to talk about is in what, as it relates to digital transformation, is putting design and user experience on an even playing field with uh, engineering and marketing, and really seeing the synthesis of all three in order to create um, amazing products. So I'll just um, get into my presentation here. So what is user experience? At its core, it's really any interaction that a person has with a branded product or service. So um, for example, I use the Virgin Airlines um, customer experience as an example of a company that really thinks holistically about all aspects of how their brand, how their products, how their service um, comes in contact with their customers. And really you can see that all across the multiple touch points, um, their brand really design of their planes, their lounges, the customer experience of checking in, um, all the way down to these little avatars that they create that are sprinkled throughout their, um, their online presence. They're really thinking about all the ways that someone's gonna interact with them and their brand. And that's really what UX is about. So when we, we tend to focus more on the digital side of user experience, but when you think about it holistically from a customer experience standpoint, it's really um, encompassing of all of these touch points. So why does UX matter? Why is it important for my business? Well, great user experience helps businesses be successful. To compete in today's environment, you really have to have an excellent user experience because Users are no longer blaming themselves when mistakes are made using a digital product. product. Um, 
like when users love a product or service, they become advocates for it. They become advocates for your brand. They share it and they can significantly lower your customer acquisition costs. So in this example, which checkout process would you rather go through? These are two donation forms um, on different uh, charitable sites. And user experience can be really ex be explained through this because um, the effort that it takes to go through the form on the first on the left hand side of the screen is greatly more than the donation form um, to the right of the screen. Also, emotion really comes into play because in this really long form, a user can become frustrated. They can forget why they even wanted to donate in the first place. They can, um, you know, really start to to reach a pain point with um, that product. As where on the right, I am reminded. Um, emotionally, what I what I care about, why I'm trying to complete this task, I get small bits of information. It's broken up into steps, so I can clearly accomplish the task that I want, and um, it's very directed. You can tell that in the, in the second option, they really gave more thought to the user experience. So, all successful projects generally follow um, a process. In our office, we develop what we call UX architectural guides, and they generally follow um, a, a flow that follows business case personas, feature sets, sitemaps, wireframes, all the way through the visual design and prototyping and usability testing. And what we found is more upfront design time almost always equals a better product. It can save you time overall, it allows for less questions and unknowns during the development, and it helps you see the forest from the trees. So in UX, we consider um, all aspects from the 10,000 foot view, the business goals and desired outcomes, all the way down to the one inch view or the, the pixel level view. So this becomes a living document and follows this general order that we iterate um, as we work on a project. So the first step is really understanding the goals of the business. So increasing online sales on an e-commerce site, or is it defining a new category with a new kind of product? Is it decreasing help tickets submitted by users of an enterprise um, software platform? That's really what this stage is about. It's about developing um, an understanding of the overarching goals, and it's about understanding the users and doing the research required to understand what's important to them. So no matter what stage um, a project is in, it's always helpful to, do, to um, align your design team with the overall goals of the business and keep these things in mind while designing every aspect of the product's user experience. A lot of times you'll see um, designers jumping in at a later stage in the process, not really understanding the overarching goals and that can often lead to undesirable outcomes. Um, so we establish the mission, the market, the problem, the opportunity, the solution, um, all these aspects that a lot of design firms wouldn't really consider um, in order to keep those things in the back of our minds as we're going through this process. So at this stage, it's really about analysis, research, uh, feedback from stakeholders, and understanding the constraints of time, budget, hours, technology, et cetera. Um, per, with personas, it's really about understanding the user, uh, using primary research to identify uh, the key concerns or use cases um, that will help us uh, design a better product for those users. It helps us gain emp empathy for them, um, put ourselves in their mindset, and inform the critical features and user stories. Now we get into the part of UX where we're actually designing things. We're architecting the system from a sitemap to a feature set to um, a lo-fi version of what these interactions of these screens will be. So we're trying to identify all the components of the user experience model, trying to understand all the features and how they relate to one another, how, they, how you navigate through them, um, and, and bringing that to life um, 
in actually designing the screens for whatever format that might be, whether it's uh, desktop, mobile, or what have you. Um, we develop the specific layouts, step-by-step -step interactions, and we tend to produce a number of prototypes at this stage to low fidelity prototypes to quickly iterate um, minim like with minimal effort so that we can quickly rule out some things and better um, refine our process and come up with a good direction for the product. And finally, through visual design, application of the brand and prototyping, we can enhance the content and functions through the graphics and develop really the X factor or the cool factor of the product. A lot of the times um, it's, it's an emotional thing that drives one customer towards one product or another. And that has to do with a lot of micro interactions that happen, little animations, um, how strong and cohesive the brand is applied throughout. All these things impact um, one user's preference of Spotify over Apple or uh, Uber over Lyft, for example. So um, it's really about reinforcing the brand. This is when um, we tend to, well, really throughout the process, we're um, working with marketers, we're working with our uh, people who are developing the analytics in order to understand um, how the brand will be applied. So we strategically use images, colors, graphics, and written copy uh, through consultation with marketers so that it fits with the tone of the brand and it's what people expect of that brand. So um, as you can see, there's a lot of considerations that impact the design of a product and it can really be difficult sometimes to strike the right balance. And that's why we must always um, test our ideas through prototyping. And this allows us to test ideas very quickly and get feedback very quickly because at the end of the day, design is never finished. It's always an iterative process. You always need to be um, using real people for feedback and using your data to inform um, your future decisions and iterations. Um, really, your data is not useful unless you're uh, taking action with it unless you're using it to inform and improve upon uh, your design, it's really ultimately useless. So we can use technology that helps us create um, heat maps of where people's eyes are tracking, where users are clicking, um, where customers are hanging out on the screen or where they're getting stuck. And this really helps us um, sort of narrow down what the next steps should be. How can we make it better? How can we streamline? Um, a user ac um, accomplishing a task more easily. So it's always important to analyze and iterate to push towards the best product possible and to overcome our own biases as designers because what's obvious to us is not always obvious to those who will actually be using the product. Um, and yeah, listening to people, uh, using data intelligently to inform future design directions will ultimately guide you towards creating the best, best product you can. Um, you, we also have a lot of useful resources on our own website, uh, neuronux.com, and you can also look us up on uh, YouTube at neuronux if you're interested in learning more about this process. That's it for now. Awesome. Thank you very much, Matt. I really, really appreciate you giving that helpful uh, presentation on user experience. I guess I have a few questions for you. Sure. How would someone how would someone know what stage they fit in? At what stage? You know, I know we talked about how earlier, you know, you were thinking about you were talking about the importance of getting UX into the process as soon as possible, but that really isn't how a lot of enterprise people think about UX. And they typically always bring them in later on after they thought about the idea, they architected it, and they just want you to come in and do the UI. Um, what would you say to those people who kind of uh, really don't see the importance of placing UX in the decision-making process. Right. Well, you can always, when you're starting from scratch, you're bringing a new perspective. Um, you're able to design from first principles. But like you said, a lot of the times in the enterprise, you have um, such big sites or such large products that are completely architected and it, it can be more of a, a refresh type of process. 
But I think it always helps to get the opinions of designers and, and successful companies will do this. They'll have um, companies, they'll pay them all. They'll have multiple companies do um, a proposal for how they would refresh it or how they would re-architect it in order to get um, insights and ideas that can help them, even if they're not quite prepared to take that large step back and redesign. So I think where a user experience um, consultancy or approach can take place, I think it's always most beneficial uh, when it's considered from the beginning, but that doesn't mean that we can't help you further along in the process. Again, our, our impact will not be as strong and it's often hard to iterate from, uh, from really bad to great. Like you can iterate from really bad to mediocre, but it's often very hard unless you're starting from scratch to, uh, to get to a great product. Right. And so I think I want to ask you a question also about the cost of that, right? The cost of actually um, of bringing in UX after a product is already deployed versus the cost of um, developing it, like designing before you optimize. Because you can't optimize something before you design it. You got to design it first, then you can optimize it. Well, I mean, the, the cost savings are enormous. I mean, considering the design at the beginning of the process, coming in with a full specification that you can hand over to your development team saves you so much money down the line because you've considered all of the critical interactions, um, all the critical user flows. You've really designed a fully functioning system even before it's developed because a lot of companies, especially startups, they'll just start coding away not considering things and then having to jam in features in different areas where they really don't belong. So uh, there have been a number of studies on the cost savings of um, approaching it from a, with a design first perspective from the very beginning. Um, I don't have those exact figures, but it's much more expensive um, further down the line to um, create a great product with as much thought put into it um, than it would be at the beginning when you can really start from first principles and think holistically from all the all these perspectives from design uh, technology constraints marketing um, etc yeah basically i think uh i think the old truism goes for every dollar that you spend on design in the pre-production phase it costs ten dollars to change it when you're building it and it costs a hundred dollars to change it once it's built yep i think I think really what we're speaking to is technical debt. That's really what you're accruing and design debt. Design yep. debt is also yep. something that people need to really understand more. And we could definitely do a follow up on that um, for our viewers. Um, but design and technical debt is something that you always want to manage. You always want to reduce whip, right? Works in progress. You got to want to definitely streamline a lot of those processes and it can get pretty expensive. Actually, you know, people sometimes yeah. think they're, they're doing the most economical thing by just kind of steaming ahead, but not really taking that time to think of all the considerations and affordances that you offer your user. It can really set you up for success or failure, you know? And so at the end of the day, if it's about collecting and capturing data in a obviously consentful, um, in a consenting way, uh, we think that's super important to unlocking innovation. Absolutely. Yeah, it, Thank it's you. really exponential, like you said. The further along you get in the process, the much more expensive it is. Thank you, Hansley. For sure. Awesome. So that was an absolutely fantastic performance. Thank you very much, Matt. We appreciate you. Um, and up next, I would really like to introduce uh, Professor Mike McGurk. Um, professor McGurk is a was also my professor when I attended Emerson College. And currently, he is the executive in residence there. Uh, Mike helps teach courses that um, really help students uh, bridge the gap between the art and science of marketing. Uh, Mike brings over 25 years of experience helping Fortune 1000 clients identify customer insights that lead to highly successful data-driven sales, marketing, and customer experience programs. Um, consistently recognized by clients and colleagues for his analytic thought leadership across a broad set of industries, he has led analytic consulting engagements at companies such as General Motors, Harley-Davidson, that one was fun, Dunkin' Donuts, 
CVS Pharmacy, BP, McDonald's, OnStar, Volvo, Microsoft, and many not-for-profit organizations. He has deep expertise in descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytic techniques. And he also has a proven track record of building and leading successful analytic consulting practices across multiple firms. He was most recently a partner at iNotion and has led analytic consulting teams at Epsilon and multiple startups. He is super passionate about analytics and evangelizing the adoption of analytical principles at progressive customer-centric organizations. Mike, I give the floor to you. Thank you. What an introduction. Thank you. <laughs> I, I also wanted to probably start off by saying that Hansley was one of my first students that I had and absolutely one of my top students. Um, <laughs> it may not surprise you for me to, to tell you that uh, he wasn't shy with sharing his thoughts in class, <laughs> uh, but that always led to a, a more active discussion and a great discussion. So Thank thanks, you. thanks for that introduction, Hansley. Absolutely. And would you need me to uh, present your slides for you or are you or, or are you all set? Yeah, if you could do that. I'm not seeing the. Sure. The, uh, That's fine. So just uh, let me know when to go to the next slide. OK. Yes. Great. Yeah, so if we can just jump to the next slide right away. Excellent. All right, so I wanted to, to spend a few minutes with you and uh, really talk about the, the discipline of the analytics. It, it certainly came up uh, quite a bit in the two earlier discussions. Uh, so this is kind of a nice segue um, into this discussion on data collection and, and the analytics. Um, but what I'd like to cover are really three Three main things. One, one is in this age of digital transformation, how, how is analytics being used broadly across the organization? Um, then I'd like to show you some of the, the different analytic tools that are commonly being used in the, the marketplace. And then finally, uh, talk about the different types of analytics uh, that are being used. And, and I'll wrap it up by sharing a uh, quick case study um, where it's shows how analytics was really put to action and, and made a I worked with. So I think if you if you ask 10 different people to describe what they think analytics is, you'd get 10 in the answers. So I did want to start by just throwing up a definition here that will kind of level set things. So this is from SAS Institute and I think it's a it's a good kind of catch-all definition where analytics is a multi-dimensional field that uses mathematics, statistics, predictive modeling, and machine learning techniques to define meaningful patterns in knowledge in recorded data. All right, so that, that's a mouthful. Um, but the thing that's going on, especially in this period of, of digital transformation, is that the amount of information that's being collected is, right? Um, there, there's a quote that's often um, stated that 90% of the information that we have today, that businesses have today, was actually created and collected just over the last two years, right? And there's another uh, researcher that, uh, did their best to try to understand how much information do businesses collect uh, globally each day. And the, the answer um, is in the neighborhood of three quintillion byte per day, followed by 18 zeros, right? So um, lots of information is being collected. But the, the point is that that talk about, and it's important that the information is being collected, but it's not going to do good if we don't find ways to effectively mine that information and begin to, to use it to make better decisions. And so I feel like there's actually a lot of pressure on analytic practices within organizations to really find the best way to, to leverage this information 
and to really turn it into what I'd call a strategic asset for businesses and something that they really feel like they can gain a, a competitive advantage in the, the marketplace with. Uh, so if you could uh, flip to the, the next slide, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about analytics in the workplace. So I spent, I would say, 90% of my career using analytics in the sales and marketing business functions. And from, from my perspective, the, the wins that in this area of the business really help to gain visibility for the use of analytics. And, and now today you see analytics really being used across the enterprise. Um, I, I would also say that because companies are so aggressively using digital platforms and collecting digital digitally sourced data, that it's really even re-energized the, the use of analytics within the sales and marketing um, areas to, to make sure that we're collecting all of the digitally sourced information and, and using it to, to develop insight-driven marketing communications. Um, but a couple of the, the things that are really, I think, exciting and, and interesting, if you kind of start moving over to, to the right on this organizational chart, the the idea of, you know, first of all, businesses having their own customer experience business functions is something to me that's that's really exciting. And you 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 may not see it always as its own separate uh, business function. Sometimes it's tucked into the sales and marketing function. But more and more businesses today, especially the the Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies, recognize. Is that customers need to invest resources, and they're they're establishing their their own departments. And those departments, I would say, are probably the most aggressive users of customer analytics um, in in the business today, right? And and the case study that I'll share with you is in that territory of of using analytics specifically um, using information that we call voice of the customer voice of the customer information to really drive a, a better solution. So I'll, I'll hold off on that for, for now. You know, one, one other just data point I'll give you is that human resources, you may not have thought of that business unit as, as necessarily being one that aggressively uses analytics, but in the last three to five years, I would say they are almost on par with how much they use analytics as sales and marketing does. Because if you, if you think about it, analytics works best when you can capture information at an individual level, right? And, and at that point, you can start to, to treat individuals differently based on their needs. Well, that idea doesn't just apply on customers, right? We, that's the way we operated for 20 plus years. But now businesses are getting smart and they recognize they can capture individual level information on employees, right? Um, so a lot of the same analytic techniques can, to be, can be deployed within the human resources area on employees. So what you see analytics being used in that area are for doing a better job recruiting talent that, that is you know, gonna be more effective inside the organization. Uh, they're using analytics to do a better job of tailoring training, right? To to make sure people are getting trained with, um, you know, in areas that they really need uh, to develop their skills. And you're you're also just seeing analytics lead to different activities that are driving experience. And and generally, better employee experience means happier employees and and more loyal employees. So it's leading to uh, longer employee retention. So I just wanted to, you know, before we got into the types of analytics, give you a sense that analytics today is not just isolated in a single business function like sales and marketing. It, it really is starting to, to get spread out across the enterprise. So Hansley, if you could go to the next slide. Great. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about different tools that are being used to to really drive analytics. And this is just a, a sample of a handful of tools. It's, it's a, 
you know, it's mind boggling how many different marketing technology tools and the analytic tools are coming out um, at an amazing pace. In, in fact, um, in a paper uh, that, I, that I was reading that if you go back about 10 years, the, there was about 150 different marketing technology providers place. That, that number has grown to about 5,000 today, right? So um, it puts a lot of pressure on marketers and data analysts to be familiar with many different tools. And I'm sure we'll start to see consolidation in mergers um, with a lot of those tool providers. But uh, the point is lots of tools out there, but I, I wanted to show you some tools across different categories. And, and so many of these categories are things that really started to, to uh, you know, explode onto the scene during this digital transformation period that, that we're in with businesses. So the idea of using voice of the customer tools web analytics tools, speech and text analytics tools, um, social media analytics and mobile app analytics. You can see that the tool providers are getting very specialized and an analyst needs to be able to operate many of these tools to really effectively um, you know, analyze all the different types of information that, that's being gathered. I'll, I'll just spend a minute on our the text analytics tools and the speech analytics tools, because I think that those are pretty exciting. What what traditionally happened, you know, in in analytics is in order to to do almost any type of analysis, you needed to first structure the information, right? So that whether you're using SAS or SPSS or Qualtrics, it would be operating off very clean, very fixed formatted, structured data with, with known values, right? But times have changed and there's so much dialogue going on between consumers and brands that we wanted to find ways to both capture that information, but start to, to mine it so that we could use it as another form of, of data to understand consumers that much so that type of information is known as unstructured data right so speed is natural language processing technologies freeform text or, or or audio and turn it into structured categorized fields right um, so examples of that would be when a consumer is calling into a, a call center that that recording would be captured and at at either during that session or after that session that that free form dialogue could be turned into structured data so that we would know what the call was about customer felt in general was it a, a positive experience a, a negative experience we'd even be able to pick up on whether that customer mentioned a competitor uh, during the conversation, right? Because that would put us on high alert that that particular customer may be disenchanted with the brand and, and may be threatening to, to leave to, to go to one of your competitors. So it's an exciting period where so much information now that, that couldn't be analyzed even you know five to six years ago now can be analyzed and it, it's really changing things you know quickly uh, within the, the data analysis field so if you could go to the next slide thank you and and so in terms of talking a little bit about the different types of analytics i i like to use this it's called an analytics ascendancy model or framework and it was developed by gartner research and i've taken the liberty of of modifying it a bit uh, but What's nice about it is it gives us a way to think about classifying all the different types of analytics into three primary categories, right? So we have descriptive analytics, which, you know, think of things such as customer segmentation solutions or doing post campaign analysis and measurement. Those are the types of analytics that would get classified into descriptive analytics. But anything that's happening in this bucket 
uh, really looking to describe the past or, or the current state, right? And then we move up this progression to predictive analytics and you start to get into many different modeling of consumer behaviors, right? So almost every business, as they start to use analytics, wants to understand what, what's the likely customer lifetime value of each one of my customers, right? So knowing that even at an individual level, that, that's a type of analytics. Hey, Mike. Like analytic. Mike. Yeah. Mike, sorry, sorry, sorry to cut you off. I think we we didn't get a chance to just hear what what that last sentence was. You're cutting in and out. Oh, okay. Can sorry. you hear me any better now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks for letting me know. Um, yeah, so I, I was talking a little bit about the predictive analytics category, and predictive analytics is all about using analytic techniques to try to anticipate a future state. Right. What what this allows marketers and business owners to do is to be proactive in their approach, not not you know wait until a consumer comes to you with a particular issue or need. You go to the consumer because you're able to predict behaviors before they happen. Right. And and so I was just sharing that a, a common type of predictive analytics technique that's deployed in companies is something called customer lifetime value, where we look to try to gauge what a customer's contribution is going to be to a company over some set period of time. It's generally not the lifetime of a customer, but it's more things like the next five, 10 years um, of that customer's life, um, you know, uh, period. And then the, the last stage is known as prescriptive analytics. And this is where you're really trying to optimize business outcomes, right? But what it really is, if you, if you think about it, it's, it's the use of insights that are developed from your descriptive analytics and your predictive analytics activities and using those to drive many, many different types of marketing experiments so that you can start to gauge for any given consumer interaction that you're having, what the next best course of action is that you should take from the company's perspective to drive a better customer relationship and a best, better customer experience. And so this, this model shows that the complexity of analytics does increase as you go from descriptive to predictive to prescriptive but the value that those analytic tools provide to the organization also increases as you go through those, those three different layers. So, yeah, so this, this is the last slide, but I wanted to share a, a case study with you. And this is an example of using voice of the customer analytics in the telecommunications industry. So uh, it was a fun period of time where the client really wanted to challenge their their uh, providers that were working with this company in the customer experience space to come up with what they were calling transfer, transformational ways to interact with consumers and find ways to reduce repeat calls, right? Because if you're a, a big brand and you have a contact center and customers first of all, don't want to call in to that 1-800 um, number to, to ask questions. But if they do, and it's a bad experience, and they feel like they have to continually call back to get their issue resolved, that can turn into a disastrous situation, right? And, and it can lead to customer churn that just is not necessary. So this client really challenged us to think about using data and using analytics to come up with new insights that could really help the agents deliver a better customer experience. And so we use both structured data that came from their CRM systems. So things such as what prior purchase behavior with this client, um, how many support interactions they'd had with the clients in the past, uh, even you know consumer demographics on each of the individual callers. And then we, we appended 
voice of the customer information that was coming from chats. So these, these were chat sessions that call or consumers were having online with agents. And so we use text analytics tools to mine um, those, those chat sessions and begin to pull out new information, new insights that we could then feed into our analytics. So the analytic solution was really a two-step process. We, we built one predictive model to try to understand for every customer that was calling into an agent, what was the likelihood that that issue was going to be completely resolved or would it require a repeat call in some future state? All right, so that, that was the idea of the first predictive model, measure the likelihood of a repeat contact happening. The second model was built to identify if a repeat contact was necessary, what were the most likely reasons why that same customer would call back this brand for additional issues or questions, right? So now agents armed with these tool, these two different models and the insights coming from these models first could understand which, which interactions they were having with consumers were likely to, to you know, result in a repeat contact. And if they saw that that was likely to happen, they would actually go through the list coming out of the second model that showed what would be those main reasons why they would be likely to contact us again. And so at this point, the agent can do one of two things, right? They, they can either say, um, so now that we've resolved the issue that, that you called in for, is there any other questions or things that you need our help with? And when you do that, you're, you're almost putting the pressure on the side of the consumer to try to anticipate issues that they're likely to have in the future that they're not gonna know how to answer, right? So instead, the second model is telling the agent, these are the top three things we think that particular consumer is likely to call back for. So now the agent can start to, to tell the consumer, people that, um, I just wanted to let you know, people that have called in for this particular issue have sometimes had these other related issues. Would you like to spend a few minutes talking about those? Or if the consumer just wants to get off the phone and doesn't have any more time available, that agent could follow up with an outbound either email or SMS text message that would provide self, self-help videos in those areas where we think that consumer is likely to have issues in, in the near future, right? So um, that to me is a, you know, is a great example of capturing the right information, integrating both structured and structured data together to be able to develop almost real-time insights that can be used by the, the business to really you know, hopefully drive a much better customer experience. And so Hansley, that, that was um, it that I, I had to, to go with in, in terms of this section. Yeah, that was fantastic, Mike. Thanks a lot. Um, I guess I, I do have a few questions um, for you in the role of data analytics in the organization. You know, um, I was just reading this article from Harvard Business Review that came out, I think, last year, May, June 2017. And it was, uh, it was titled, What's Your Data Strategy? And in it, they were talking about all the important things that modern enterprises need to actually run and facilitate like healthy analytical practices at their companies. And one really interesting thing that stood out to me was that less than 44% of all structured data is analyzed by businesses and even less than 1% of unstructured data is even analyzed at all. So I guess I'd really be interested into like, how could we, how could we decrease those numbers, right? How could we increase visibility into unstructured data? How could we increase visibility into the structured data of the business? What are some, do you have any tips for some of our viewers or some things that they should be paying attention to in order to achieve those goals? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, right? I think a, a big part of that is, is the idea of developing a, a data strategy that is done at the 
you know, enterprise level, right? I think you had even pointed out earlier that one of the main reasons why information doesn't often fully get utilized is that it's sitting in databases and silos inside of different departments. And if your data strategy is developed at that business unit level, duplicate information residing across the enterprise, and you're not going to have that situation that you brought up of having one version of the truth, right? Um, so the data strategy needs to get um, raised to the enterprise level, right? And it needs to be established at that level so that all the departments that are consumers of information and also collectors of information are all operating off the same procedures and standards. And then all of that information is going to get consolidated into one single uh, database that now can be more effectively used by you know, many stakeholders across the business. And, and so many, another follow-up question, many business leaders often talk about culture as being the number one driver of initiating a lot of these changes. In your life experience, how have, how have you navigated that issue of culture? Does that mean getting more leadership on? Does that mean getting executives and having them own, own these projects? What are some ways that you could recommend to some of our viewers uh, that you know, they can um, you know, effectively access all this information and change the culture of the organization there? Yeah, yep, another great question. I, I think it, it starts with developing a culture of wanting to use information, especially customer information, to develop better products, better ways to communicate with consumers, um, you know, just better, better, um, you know, initiatives are across the board. And, and so it can be challenging. You certainly need to have senior level executives buy into this and, and really support it. Because what I've found is a data driven approach to running a business requires more resources, right? It, if, if you've operated in a model in the past, where it was more of a one size fits all approach to executing communications. Now we're looking to, to move to a, either a segment level approach or a one-to-one -one approach to communicating with customers. That's hard, right? And that requires a lot of resources and a lot of extra work. But the point is it's gonna pay dividends, right? It, it's going to drive better customer metrics because consumers are gonna feel the impact of that by having better experiences. So, so it does start with the culture. It starts with leadership, really buying into it and explaining to employees throughout the business why this is so important that we go in this direction and always tie it back to the consumer, right? We want to be a customer centric business that really it's number one objective is to satisfy and exceed expectations that consumers have of us. If we do that well, we'll be a, a strong, th thriving business for, for years to come. If, if we don't, we, we risk that our competitors are gonna go down that, that path and, and then that's when things get you know, more dicey. So culture is, is definitely a, a big, a big um, you know, area of focus, that's for sure. Thank you very much, Mike. This was a fantastic presentation. Um, at this time, I urge any of our viewers, you do have the capability to actually join um, our webinar and ask questions to any of our subject matter experts. Um, so if you guys ever have any questions, just raise your hand. You guys should be able to control that from your consoles, um, from the user consoles. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to turn off your presentation now. And I'm really excited um, to introduce Sean McLaughlin. Um, Sean McLaughlin, he's the founder of McLaughlin Media. He is a 2011 Harvard Extension School graduate, and he's a seven-year digital media vet who has worked for and with some of the biggest agencies and companies over the course of his career in Boston and in New York. So he famously worked at MediaVest and Spark Foundry. He worked at my alma mater, Digitas LBI, um, where he was on the Goodyear account. Um, and so he also worked for Comcast and handled a lot of their ad operations and managed ad operations teams 
uh, for Angie's List and also Bush Gardens. Sean, welcome to the webinar. How's it going, guys? Thanks for having me. I really, uh, really appreciate the time. Um, thank you. <laughs> awesome. So I'm just going to go ahead and get your presentation loaded up here, and you have the floor. Cool. Awesome. Um, can I control? Oh, I can control it. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Yeah, so um, thank you guys so much uh, for joining today. I really appreciate everyone's time. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go through um, kind of digital targeting strategies. Um, you know, something that, you know, what I realized and why I started McLaughlin Media is that I saw that there's a ton of small to mid-sized businesses that have these tools to really go out and target digitally. Um, that they might not even know of, know exist, or know how to even execute on. Um, a lot of companies that I was working with or started to work and consult with, they had some like really good, you know, right out of college or a couple of years out of college uh, marketers who were really good at design. But, you know, these designs are great, but they weren't getting in front of any eyeballs because no one knew how they, they didn't know how to target what tools to use, how to use them different channels. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the kids and people coming out of college now, especially at a young level, they obviously understand social media, you know, how to make cool content, but not necessarily how to go and target people that are effective for the brand. You know, if you have, you know, 500 followers and you're just posting boomerang ads, you know, it's going to be a pretty lame experience for your end user. Even just good graphics, if, you know, even if you do put something together, that's nice. Um, you know, you're looking at, only 500 eyeballs and who's going through that. So how do you kind of scale out? How do you target the correct people to get the right message from the right people at the right time? And so that's something that my agency has uh, really specialized in. And we've won a couple of clients doing that. And I'm going to walk you through some actual uh, execution um, that we've done for one of our clients, um, Apex Entertainment out in Marlboro, which is the... Um, biggest entertainment, indoor entertainment facility um, in New England. Um, so, you know, what we do, I kind of talk through that. Um, Hansel gave a nice intro. So let's start off with uh, display retargeting. What is retargeting? Well, retargeting, which, you know, people refer to as remarketing sometimes. I call it retargeting. I think a lot of people do. But you'll hear remarketing. And they, they, those terms are used interchangeably. Um, it's an advertisement that can keep your brand in front of bounced or engaged traffic from your website. Um, so basically, in the next slide, I'll go through how the idea of this works, right? So take, for example, this is the Apex Entertainment website. And through what is called um, a TMS or a tag management system, um, we are able to place pixels um, based on where people have been on the site to create the right segmented audiences to deliver the right message to the user. So for example, how kind of this slide is broken down, you can see in the far left, we just have general retargeting. So someone who reached the homepage, you know, we're gonna hit them with the different ad rotations based off of, you know, where, you know, what products or what general offerings that we have. And this can apply for anything. I'm just using Apex as a, an example of uh, one thing that we do. So, for example, they have uh, golf simulators, go-karts, um, video games. They have a, a tavern um, that's over there. Um, so it's, you can, you can give them, the audience kind of everything that's involved in the website to kind of get your brand, your name, and what the offering is in front of people. Now, as people go deeper into the website, you know, some people might just, you know, if you just go to the website, you might be generally interested. Now, when you see dig further deeper into the website, this is when the targeting becomes really important. For example, someone that's interesting, just like goes, goes to the dining and leaves, mostly they're kind of, they just want to look at kind of the dining options of what that, what's going on there. So we target and we give them specifically dining creative. Um, if they're more interested in attractions, they'll just be getting the attractions creative. Um, same thing with specials. Um, you look at that. So if someone's like really interested in specials and that's one of their last touch points, um, you know, we'll be sending specials. Um, big thing that they have is, um, you know, parties and events and corporate events, um, including birthday parties. Um, if someone's going into that and we have, you know, deeper they go on the funnel, we have different creative, but um, 
we'll be hitting them, those users back and forth with those, the, that messaging, because that's what they are engaging with and that is what is relevant. Um, you know, what I feel is like the biggest crime is someone that's going to your site and you're just bombarding them with a bunch of, you know, nonsensical stuff that they're not interested in. Not only are you going to be wasting impressions, but you're not giving the user what they want. You know, giving just the data that they're just giving you based off their site traffic. So and the other big thing with retargeting, um, you know, what messages do you want to send to people during what time of the day, what's going on? what promotions you're actually using. So for general site retrafficking, we, um, we want to engage people with different things based on like some events that might be happening. So for example, um, someone that generally came to the site um, during a school vacation, we'd love to push you know, the school vacation promos during the day. Um, if it's a snow or a weather event, we you know use our creative uh, dynamic creative optimization based off weather triggers and events to serve different types of creative. So it's engaging and relevant to what is going on in the area. You know, if it's a rainy day, if it's um, if it's snowing, and it's like, hey, oh, cool, wow, Apex is still open. Like, I'd love, okay, the kids are driving me nuts. So let's get them over there. Um, other things, you know, if the the Patriots are playing and there's a special engaging that general traffic um, with messaging that is relevant um, based off specific events and kind of takeovers. Um, the other cool thing which we've been doing is working with um, different uh, alcohol sponsors um, for co-branding because, you know, they that building in the Metro West is the highest uh, grossing liquor and uh, alcohol sales um, out there. So a lot of industries want to take our data that we're using for people that are coming into the building to be able to serve their message to get people in to try their products. Um, so we've been doing a lot of co-branding and getting budget on um, that way for our brand, which has been great. Um, another cool thing to kind of look at is kind of like your general creative rotation. Like, what are you doing as far as day partings going? Like the times of the week? Um, what do you want to do? So for example, you know, they have um, a lunch for, um, a lunch deal, which is, you know, within 10 minutes, you'll get your lunch served, which is a big thing in that, you know, 495, 128 belt, where if people are going there, they want to get in and out during lunch, not necessarily looking to play the attractions of the games. They just want something cool to go to and bounce. So relevant for timing, days of the week, if, you know, if you have a, 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 um, a special going on a certain day of the week, you know, a couple days leading up to that, that's fine to send the messaging for, but you don't want to be sending out a messaging for your Tuesday special on a Saturday. It's No one's going to look at that. People aren't going to respond to it, and the data will show that over time. So day parting and also, you know, uh, time parting, kind of going backwards. So then obviously, you know, the rest is you're serving a general uh, creative and your rotation as so. So that's with just general site traffic that you're, that you're getting. So, okay, that's people going to your site. Now that might not be a ton of people, especially for small to mid-sized businesses that are looking to scale out and find people that are relevant. So how do you go out and find those more relevant people who might not have engaged with your brand or even know about it? So that's when lookalikes and third-party data segments come into play. So what is a lookalike? So a lookalike is a statistical data model of segments that you have that you've correlated from your first party data that mimics the audience of prospected people. So for example, you know, using some of these, uh, you know, major kind of DMPs, um, you're, where they're able to ingest and see based off data that they have like about a user what is this user's demo? What what do they do? Are they, you know, are they male? Are they female? What's the age bracket? What's this? What's kind of like your general audience? And then they're able to build a statistical model of that user that then you can go out and bid on people that are exactly like the people have gone to your site that haven't necessarily been there, which is a very powerful tool. And it's, you know, the next step up from kind of like your marketing funnel as it goes um, up and out of people who you're trying to capture. You know, so 
that's a very powerful tool that we we like to use as our lookalike audiences, um, leveraging kind of some DMP, which is data management platform um, tools. So beyond that, what is, uh, you know, I have third party segmentations. Now, data segments are audiences that, the, that an advertiser, for example, is going out to set up to use. So for example, um, you know, if you're looking to target, you know, a single male or female, 31 to, I mean, uh, 21 to 35, they have segments for that. You know, usually the DSPs or people, you know, your display media or Facebook or anything that you're working with will have people with how you can segment out and go bid on data. If you're looking for mothers only, fathers, mothers and fathers with children, mothers and fathers with multiple children, um, people who work in HR, executives, they're all data segments that have these where these um, ag data aggregators, you can go and literally buy these audiences. So if there's something that you think um, based off your, you know, your site data or people who you're interested in bringing into your business, no matter what it is, um, these segments are very powerful. So you're not just shooting your ad out into oblivion on the internet. Um, you're literally getting very targeted with what you're doing, being smart with your spend and making really good data-driven decisioning based off that spend. So to give an example of kind of, um, you know, what, you know, we'd be looking for is we go like out of the funnel when it's just, you know, people who we know that have engaged, like what are we looking for with these third party segments? So for example, up top for, um, you know, what we're using like third party data segments for. So for example, when we have like a wing promo or the Patriots are on, we're buying segments, whether it's, um, you know, display or social, it's like we're looking for active football fans you know, who are, you know, within a 10 mile radius that are usually the, you know, skews male, you know, about 21 to 49. So we're going on and actively buying those segments, you know, people who maybe have not interacted with the brand or haven't because we're actually negative retargeting the, our site traffic, um, who don't know anything about Apex and like, oh, cool, wow, they have a wing from the Patriots are on. What is this? Let me interact with this. This is something that interests me and we know that ahead of time. You know, for the school um, vacation weeks, you know, we're looking for moms and fathers with um, with kids, you know, and even stay at home moms. There are data segments with stay at home moms. So we know it's like, OK, they're probably going crazy with the kids bouncing around like where, you know, within a certain radius. Again, like we want to target our ads to those kids. Um, you know, one of the big things that we're doing with uh, with part, you know, with the parties is we're targeting HR professionals within a 50 mile radius um, of of Apex, you know, with, with corporate parties. Um, we're using kind of that uh, that overlay of just like who works in HR, because those are usually the people who plan the parties. And also we're getting um, executives, the executives in third party, they cost a little more than just HR professionals. So we're limiting on the executives. Those are the people who make decisions about like, who's going to book a corporate party, like how's, how's it gonna work and all that. And we're getting our message in front of people. And there are you know, a ton of businesses that are pretty big who don't utilize any of these tools. And now, cause like we have, are gonna have a big share in market. It's a huge advantage for us. Um, and the lookalikes, you know, are kind of from the last slide. It's kind of the same thing. Cause it's, uh, we know like what that audience is. It's pretty similar to our retargeting audience. So you can see the slide below is pretty similar to the, slide before. Um, so yeah, just going into kind of the corporate events, this is kind of just showing, you know, the opportunity that um, that Apex has. Um, actually, within one of my uh, platforms that I have, all these little businesses I actually have a geofence around them. So we for display, it's kind of tough to really dive into location because, um, you know, that's going off of, you know, your computer's not sending out um, uh, lot long signals. However, your cell phone is. So <laughs> all these uh, little companies that uh, we have here are actually geofence their building. So they also, you know, they see some ads if they, if you know, the HR executives if they're in that cell phone segment. Um, so they get relative ads, and we're really cutting down on kind of our spend. We're just being hyper targeted, hyper vigilant. It's a lot of work, but. Um, you know, it saves a lot of money and it gets, you know, relevant data out, um, relevant, I say, so say ads out based off uh, the data. So social, paid, earned, and owned. So I'm gonna go and, you know, for our social techniques, you know, what what does paid, what is paid, what is earned, and what is owed? Now, if you know, if you've been in marketing for a while, you know this, but if, you know, you haven't been, um, you know, let's, I'm gonna walk you through it really quickly right now. So paid. 
So pay just in general, you know, whether that's, um, you know, anything, you know, in the advertising and marketing spectrum is um, it's an activity that the company's using that is generated or paid by the company. So example, everything that we talked about kind of before, when you're putting your image out there in front of people, that's paid. What is earned? You know, when, when, as far as social media goes, it's um, when someone's following you and the content that you're sharing with people. Um, I'm sorry, no, that, that, that's owned. Um, so earned is once, you know, someone is uh, sharing your content, um, looking at it organically, mentioning it, sharing it, retweeting. For example, if you put out like a deal and someone's like, wow, it's a cool deal. I just want to share this with my network. Um, that's the earn, the uh, the earned portion. The owned is when um, you know you're acquiring traffic or people looking through your social channels who want to interact with your brand or are following you because you have engaging, cool, meaningful content. And um, the content that's a whole nother discussion. But as far as data and you know that goes, that um that is what kind of owned is. So for us with, um, you know, what we're looking to do across like our strategy, you know, you can notice the top, it again, looks um, very similar. So these are people, you know, who, you know, on Facebook through or Instagram, you know, through the pixels that they have on their site. Again, we can go out and we can target, you know, people who are football fans, you know, cause when, you know, you're in Facebook or in the platform, say if you've liked the Patriots, you know, Facebook knows that you like the Patriots. They know your age because you put it in, um, you know, same thing with mothers and kids, you know, same thing with the HR professionals. You know, the, Facebook has such a plethora of data, um, which obviously I think, you know, that's been exposed and talked about a lot recently, but it's very powerful for marketers. Um, so you can go out and target and get like really good messages and put together really good campaigns to get eyeballs um, in front of your brand. Um, and also people, uh, you know, who are, you know, targeted or even like non-followers, you know, through sponsored ads, um, you know, you're able to put everything in front of them, whether that's, uh, you know, promotional messages, days, timing, you know, run your social campaigns, you know, very similar to uh, to display, you know, except for Facebook, a lot of the data is built into the platform. You don't need to aggregate it from a bunch of different sources. Um, one thing, too, is, you know, I want to mention is kind of like... Uh, within these social platforms is knowing kind of like what audience uses what platforms. So for example, for like Instagram and the stories that we post and the paid ads, we know like kind of what audiences we're looking for and just kind of the general concept. Um, you know, one thing that we, we made a push on was within LinkedIn was, you know, we're, this is the best one, the best sources of data and the best set of eyeballs to get in front of these HR and uh, business executives within the certain radius of um, our entertainment center to put relevant ads and get the ad in front of people. So they're, they're looking, wow, okay, cool. They have a corporate event or, hey, it's school vacation, you know, to the HR, you know, crowd it's like hey come by apex you know check us out you know here's a link to like a coupon you know for twenty dollars off a rise whatever so they're bringing the kids they get to see what the place is and like wow this is cool we should hold an event here um so our next thing that we're going to talk about with data which is a very powerful thing when it comes to search is uh conquesting so what is conquesting Conquesting you use to deploy advertisements for one's products or services and branding against a competitor's or a competing product and their offerings, which is very powerful. I'll use, for example, um, Dave and Buster's. Um, you know, using AdWords, you can literally go and bid on Dave and Buster's <laughs> and say, like, you know, when someone searches Dave and Buster's, I would like our, you know, search ad for Apex to show up up top. There's a lot of small and mid-sized businesses who do not use search conquesting against brands or people, that, you know, that they know or even use ads to protect their own brand. Um, Dave and Buster's that we saw was one of them. You know, we're, we're going to have ads running against, you know, Dave and Buster's and, you know, so when someone goes and wants to see David Buster's, you know, the first thing that's going to pop up is going to be an Apex ad on top of that. And they're going to be like, why, uh, you know, what is this Apex? Let's go and check this out, you know, using that CPC. So, um, you know, within a, obviously a desired radius around 
Apex. We don't want um, you know people targeting you know Texas or using irrelevant things. So you know the the damn busters that are close by that we're, we're targeting. Also, you know every bowling alley that's in the center, every arcade. You know these are things that are like very powerful that a lot of small mid sized businesses don't necessarily do or think of. And the great thing about that is if you're a small business, you can win a lot of these bids relatively easily because no one else is is doing it. And we're exploiting that one of the things that we're doing. Um, same thing is, uh, you know, also be very vigilant of who might be conquesting you on different platforms. For example, um, you know, in Yelp, you know, we're getting conquested against um, a couple of things that are relevant to us and a couple of things aren't. Like people just buy, you know, a segment of restaurants, you know, on Yelp and try to conquest against that within a certain area. So it's one of these things we can see here where, you know, someone's searching go-karts in Marlboro, which is where my client's located. You can see that, uh, you know, we're going to be the third result there. You know, which is a bummer because um, someone might be like, oh, what's escape? What's you know, what's escape the room? What's this bar? So one thing is, you know, unfortunately, it's one of those things that you want to either, you know, think about maybe buying your own spot to make sure like you're you are the top there or being OK with like, hey, you know, someone's looking at go karts like some of these ads are the people that are running these ads. It's not really relevant. They're going to go to us anyways. Um, it's just something that you always have to keep an eye on because everything's changing daily as far as who's running what campaigns, whatever. And it's, you know, important as a marketer to stay on top of that. And that kind of goes into like kind of the, the whole funnel of kind of like how things work. I tried to kind of start it, you know, from the beginning of like what to do with your site traffic and your data and kind of work it up, you know, and out, you know, as far as, you know, who you're retargeting, making sure you're getting that brand engagement, making sure, you know, when you go up further, people who don't necessarily know about your brand, you're putting your brand in front of them when they're searching relevant things that can happen with your brand. For example, for Mapex, whether it's bowling, like, you know, another entertainment facility, um, we're all trying to get in front on top of that. Um, and then kind of just using, you know, your social, you know, to kind of, and anything else as far as, you know, display and putting out in the ether using, you know, direct kind of targeting um, of who you think will be relevant, you know, to eventually get down, get in the funnel and get someone engaged and go coming into Apex or interacting with the brand in some way that will help them in, um, interact with Apex to come to in the future. And uh, that's that's it for me. If there's anyone that's like interested or like to talk more about your brand, I can be reached at Sean at McLaughlinMedia.com. Um, and I'm sure there'll be some contact information left on this webinar. And if uh, any of this interests you, I, I look forward to being in touch. Thanks again, Sean. That was a fantastic presentation. That was great. I hope a lot of our viewers got um, some helpful tidbits from that. I know that there are a lot of great little pieces of that. So I, I really want to ask you a question, Sean. Um, in terms of like optimizing your ad budget, budget, how does one come up with like an effective budget? How, how do you, how do you know what to spend and where to spend first? You know, like what, what would be some of the first steps in order to, to, to get up to that level where you are initiating conquesting tactics and things like that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, initially it depends on, I mean, it, it depends on your scope and what you're looking to do. Right. Um, for example, we, you know, my client was very lucky that the things we were looking to conquest, um, we weren't going up against anyone else. So when the auctions and bidding comes up, um, you know, so when you are bidding on stuff, you're in what in relatively what is a, it's a, it's an auction and they're mostly what they, you call second price bid auctions. So say if something is worth a dollar to me, someone clicking on this is worth a dollar to me. The next person that might be only worth 50 cents. So you know, and the third person might be worth 30. So when the bid goes through and you're having all this auction, like I'll bid 30, I'll bid 50, I'll bid a dollar. What happens in the second price auction is it finishes a cent above the second highest bid. So it'd be 51, I'd win the, I'd bid up to a dollar, have the opportunity to, but I'd win the bid at 51 cents, which is cool, right? Now the cool thing, you know, for, you know, some clients and especially in the small to mid-sized businesses that a lot of people aren't even running ads. So you can win, Bids at a cent, you know, which is crazy. You can have your brand and you can be crushing it. You know, yeah. other things which are crazy, um, you know, when you go into very competitive things, when, you know, digital is a big thing. I'll take like lawyers, for example, um, depending on what type of law you're in, um, can be like very competitive. We can have people bidding upwards of $30, 
for a click, you know, um, cause they know if like they get a case, you know, um, depending on whatever it is or what they're looking for, they know that's going to be worth $30,000. So for them, if they have to spend, you know, and a lot of people aren't looking for a special thing. I'll give an example. I don't know something criminal. Let's think about, I don't know, like let's say DUI law. Okay. Someone knows if I get a client, you know, who looks D up DUI lawyers, they probably need a lawyer and they're going to hire one. Right. Probably people who've never um, had something like that happen to them. They're just literally going on the internet. They have no clue. Like, okay, who's the first guy whose site looks good? You know, for them to click in and get someone, and they're probably, I don't know, what it's with a GUI lower cost, like five to 10 grand. So that $30 click, yeah. to a client who's going to spend five grand. I mean, that, that's, a, so that's, that's what it is. And so, you know, different, depending on what vertical you're in, the money can change. And, so that's why I'm kind of just kind of give you a vast kind of thing. So when you're scaling and you're looking at it, you have to look at like what you're doing, what you're looking to do, what your competition is doing, and then kind of adjust your scale, and your budget accordingly based on like, if I spend this, what am I going to get in return? What are kind of like my ultimate KPI goals to make sure that I have some like multiple of success that this is going out? And am I looking to make money off my marketing? Am I looking to like maybe lose a little bit of money? Like, am I open to that? There, there's a lot of questions that you have to ask as, as a business and a business owner of like, you know, what kind of your end game is and what you're looking to do. That's fantastic. And does, uh, does, does vertical and deliverability in terms of the format play an impact? Like, you know, I imagine that a, some, I like imagine a lot of people who are purchasing media aren't really thinking about what their customers are using. They're kind of thinking about their own personal beliefs and interjecting a little bit of their own bias into what they perceive their customers to be using. But I always know that it's important to get in front of, get on the screen that your user's on. How can users figure out where their people are in the first place? Um, is it through the lookalikes exclusively? Is it through exclusively buying third party? But is there a way for them to get some first party information related to that? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a great question. I think there's um, there's a lot of tools that you can use. I mean, just one simple one that people use all the time is like Google Analytics. You know, you can tell through your site, you know, as long as you have enough traffic, who your general audience is, how they skew, whatever, and then go out and make decisions to buy the media based off that. Um, other things, you know, as you scale up as an advertiser, you know, it's like using like a DMP and then like setting segments up against, you know, the DMPs, like segments of audiences that you could buy in third targeting, which is like more advanced thing. And, you know, you're looking at, you know, six or seven figure budgets to start getting into that. But that's like one thing you do. But just basic, if you're just looking to see like who's coming to your site, and, you know, the thing is just like just simple Google Analytics can, can give you that and just give you a baseline to go off and do. And, you know, it's like anything in marketing, you know, for, you know, what I try to do and tell my like small and mid-sized businesses, I'm trying to set them up with like, you know, the biggest and the, the best of what they can with their budget. You know, um, like I'm trying to give them like an Acura at a Honda budget. You know, it's like, you know, if you want to do stuff crazy and you can go out and buy a Ferrari, you know, you're going to get something that's 600 horsepower that will destroy everything. You know, you can get that, too. It's, um, you know, it's kind of trying to mix the both of, you know, the budget that you have and using the best tools that you can based off kind of what you're looking to spend. That's great. Thanks so much, Sean. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Um, it's like it's at this point I kind of open the floor to any questions that we have from our live viewers. Um, at this point, I'm going to uh, also include in the chat um, contact information uh, for the various um, subject matter experts that we kind of put on display today. Uh, also, Professor McGurk is unveiling a new master's program at Emerson College. So if any of you are looking to get a leg up, in data science, uh, he's your man. So I'm going to include his email also within chat and broadcast that to everybody as well. Thanks for doing that. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm telling you, it is Mike is a fantastic professor, and I don't think there's anyone more suited to provide that for you. Um, so yeah, guys. With that, I think that's really it. I don't. I don't think we have any uh, too many questions coming in. Um, at this point, I'm just going to launch a simple poll. Um, just really asking some of the viewers. I'm asking you, what are you guys mostly interested in? What would you guys like to hear more about um, in your webinars? This is something, guys. I'm very excited 
uh, as our first webinar. This was a fantastic experience, and I look forward to developing greater webinars um, in the future. Okay, so we're getting some UX polling here, getting some people asking for some more UX work. So, Matt, you and I are definitely going to get busy with that. Um, I would love to actually schedule follow-up um, webinars um, with any of you. Mike, I know that you want to talk a little bit more about the program. If you want to get into um, any specifics or anything like that, you can in uh, future webinars. But this is something that we hope to be doing on a regular and more consistent basis because we really believe in the power of sharing knowledge and providing content and enabling doers. So that's what we're in the business of doing. And I love it. I love teaching. And I could definitely get used to doing webinars a lot more. Um, so with that, I think that's about it on the poll. So boom, that's a resounding UX. We'd like to hear more UX. Granted, we didn't have as much of a, a, a bigger audience size to let us know about some yeah. different polls. I definitely think um, we stoked the fire a little bit and people are definitely interested um, in learning more about these things. So gentlemen, I want to say thank you for joining me on this webinar. This was fantastic. I'll make sure to get the replay to you soon. Thanks for having Great. us. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.